Um, right, our first panel for today um, will be the Sharia, re Religious Arbitration, and Family Law. Um, chairing and introducing this panel is our Gita Segal, who has tremendous experience working in the field. Uh, she's been behind a number of campaigns um, bringing the subject into light and making it a mainstream one. Um, she's also been behind the efforts um, uh, challenging, challenging the Sharia courts and its implications. Uh, please welcome to the stage uh, Gita Segal. <laughs> Afsana. Afsana Latruas, Diana Nami, Hussam Mahmoud, uh, Nisreen Rahman, and Yasmin Rahman. Sadiqur couldn't be here today, he's not feeling well, but yeah, welcome to the rest of the panel. Is my mic functional? Um, and uh, we don't have Nisreen Rahman with us. Uh, who is one of the founders of British Muslim Secular Democracy and has been a very valuable member of the One Law for All campaign. Uh, but I'm very happy to welcome those of us who ha are here and have got out of our sick beds <laughs> and made it. Um, so on my far right, there's Afsana Lasho, uh, who is going to talk about her own experiences of cha challenging um, Sharia law in three different <coughs> countries. Uh, including two uh, supposedly secular legal systems in Britain and in France, uh, Hussain Mahmoud of the Culture Project, uh, who really has challenged everything everywhere, <laughs> but particularly in the Kurdish region, um, and uh, Dana Nami, uh, the head of ICRO, the Iranian Kurdish Women's Rights Organization, uh, that does uh, one of the leading uh, women's organizations dealing with violence against women and women's rights. And my very own friend and colleague, Yasmin Rahman, who was Secularist of the Year uh, last year? 2017. <laughs> and, uh, and has been uh, a strong supporter, as a Muslim, a strong supporter of the One Law for All campaign. Now, I thought we could have a few responses to the film, but first I wanted to say that, of course, we're watching the film in uh, a country which is supposedly a secular country and which is uh, supposed to protect the rights of women. But what happened at Partition, as the film briefly explained, was that the laws of the majority were reformed in each country. <laughs> so that in India, uh, there were uh, at, for the time, extremely progressive laws passed that ended polygamy, that uh, brought in divorce by mutual consent, that produced more inheritance rights than previously and so on for Hindus. Um, and in Pakistan in the 1960s, there was a family law ordinance which uh, uh, limited polygamy and, and uh, uh, caused marriages to be registered and brought a number of advances. But in each case, the minority remained uh, basically forced into a ghetto by the powers that be who didn't want to deal with the issues uh, that the challenges of uh, reforming the laws of the minority. And there have been a series of disgraceful decisions by Indian governments uh, which have actually uh, given more power to Muslim fundamentalists uh, in India. Uh, but what we see, uh, what the, the, the issue that they discussed is one that I believe we have here today. And that's really what I wanted to ask us about. And to start with you, Yasmin, at the end, did you recognize some of the issues there that the women in India were talking about from your research into these issues here in Britain? Absolutely, I, th I think this, I've said this before at these conferences, this is a global fight. This is not just a fight for Muslim women, this is a fight for all women. Every legal system has its issues. But at least there is um, there's transparency with the British legal system, it, with, with, even with its difficulties. There are routes that you can appeal to. There is an opportunity to change the law. And I think we've got to commend the women, not the Muslim women, not just in India and the other women who stand with them, but across 
the Muslim um, majority world. What really saddens me, though, from my research here in the UK is the constant acquiescence of our government to religious groups and the deference to religious groups. We have religious imams now delivering domestic violence training. We have imams who... Everything now is framed around faith. We have faith groups getting an increasing share of an ever-reducing state pot of money that's not going to specialist women's organisations but is going to faith groups. And when we had the inquiry on, um, into the Sharia courts, which, I mean, was appalling, the Home Affairs Select Committee, uh, particularly Mariam's treatment at the inquiry, which I still am really galled by, and then the so-called independent inquiry, which was headed up by Mona Siddiqui. Muslim women in Britain said this is only a Muslim women's issue. It is not. Because those gains that will be made by the Islamist bodies here will then be called upon by the Sikh groups, by the fundamentalist Christian groups, by the fundamentalist Jewish groups. It will spread. And who will suffer as a consequence? It will be women of all faiths and none. And that's something we have to bear in mind. The other thing that I think is, is possibly different, and it may not have been shown in the film, is the issues are not just limited to divorce. The issues that I've picked up through um, the research that I've done and some of the case studies are available on the Home Affairs Select Committee website, it's, a, it's impacting on inheritance. So women are being denied their rights of inheritance. One of the case studies was of a woman who was widowed who had worked all her life on market stalls in the freezing cold in the winter, come rain, come shine, to raise her children and work alongside her husband in the family business. And her adult sons, by taking recourse to Sharia, have taken her home, have taken her pension, have taken everything from her. I've spoken to women who've lost their children because the, the Sharia courts, and I do call them courts, have passed over custody of the children to, um, to the father. We've got men who are, who are calling on imams and bringing them into their homes and saying, my wife will not do as she's told, and Sharia is then used to enforce gender roles. This has got to be stopped. It has absolutely got to be stopped. Diana, you yeah. produced a huge amount of information as well, a lot of research for the Home Affairs Select Committee. We should say there were two inquiries. The government ordered a Sharia review. And the irony is that this campaign, which has fought for years to have Sharia investigated, ended up boycotting that inquiry because it was set up as a theological inquiry. And it did have a judge involved with it, but he was <coughs> such a right-wing judge uh, belonging to a Christian fundamentalist organization and, and serving in an ecclesiastical court that he was the nearest thing we have to a Sharia judge in this country. So we had to boycott the inquiry because it was untransparent and difficult. But ICRO, among other groups, did produce a whole lot of information to the Home Affairs Select Committee because even, even though that was flawed, it was at least public and transparent and it was part of a parliamentary process and we believe in making parliament function. So yeah. ICRO... <coughs> Okay, um, thank you for inviting me and congratulations for the 10 years of hard work uh, and uh, the challenging, difficult issue, very dangerous issue around the world by, um, uh, by one law for all. Uh, yes, uh, ECRO, Iranian and Kurdish Women's Rights Organization, is, uh, uh, we are dealing on a daily basis with cases uh, from women uh, who are uh, from Middle Eastern, which is usually mainly are Muslim women from Middle Eastern community uh, in the UK. Uh, their cases are very typical to the cases that you have seen. And uh, uh, the challenges we have and they have with the Sharia courts in the UK, of course, I crow ask for ban Sharia courts in the UK and as a secular organization, we try to, uh, we tried very hard and uh, to challenge the Sharia courts in the UK and doing uh, our research and giving information to any, uh, any uh, parliamentary 
organization who really wanted to uh, who wanted to do something about that. Unfortunately, British government, as a secular government, <laughs> the first thing they are considering is the right of the religious uh, organization, not only religious, but fundamentalist uh, actually. Uh, human rights and women's rights, uh, um, most of the times for Muslim community, has been jeopardized uh, for uh, the sake of the religious organizations and Muslim organizations in the UK. I am talking especially about Muslim because it's our majority of our cases are from Muslim community and on the daily basis they are seeking divorce and the divorce become a problem especially for them, inheritance, custody for children and many other issues, polygamy, this uh, triple uh, talaq that uh, uh, you heard about. It is happening in the UK here uh, in London on the street of uh, very you know, very democrat, democrat country, one of the very democrat country in the world, the people, the very people that are forcing children into a marriage and uh, they walk down the street freely without any uh, persecution and government in the UK has uh, uh, closed their eyes uh, uh, and uh, really let them operate hidingly in the UK. There have been so many TV reports, journal journalist reports, and case by cases that we have, we gave the information to government, but still you didn't, you didn't see any, um, you know, uh, any action from them. For example, even from their very own, uh, institution, <coughs> Hapot Force Marriage Unit in the UK, which is an uh, a organization or a project that's run by Foreign Commonwealth Office and uh, Home Office. 28% uh, of the people, the women they, or the men, they are saving our children uh, from, uh, from forced marriage. So that means, and that happening in the UK. And those families has not been persecuted. The imams and mullahs that married them has not been persecuted and they are free to make more of those cases. Uh, in my opinion, they are uh, crimes, not only the break of uh, their human rights, rights, but it's crime and it's, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, not safeguarding children, but put children at risk of uh, rape at risk, at risk of death and uh, uh, immature um, pregnancy. And for them that many of them also have been the second wife or the third wife of a man that can be even of the age of their father. They have to pretend that they are school girls, for example, going to schools. But in the meantime, at home, they, be, they will be the husband of someone. So we urge uh, uh, the UK government really to ban this problem uh, issues in the UK. Uh, all women from Muslim community or any other community should be entitled for the same law and uh, for to be equal, treated equally before the law and not any uh, discrimination under the name of the religion or if they are from minority communities, there shouldn't be any discrimination against them. This is issues that on a daily basis we are dealing with, and we have got so many cases that need urgent help from government. Thank you, Diana. What we actually found was uh, very important in our uh, deliberations between South Hall Black Sisters, ICRO, um, Mariam doing her research on the fundamentalist networks that were involved with the uh, Sharia councils. We found that what they're doing is by insisting on a separate religious divorce, even where there is a civil divorce, they've actually produced a form, a com a, like a, a community form of zina, a, a, a zina law that operates at the level of the community. Because a previous generation, I think this was um, Yasmin's very important finding in some of the cases that she looked at, uh, uh, a woman whose daughter uh, had been forced to go to a Sharia council, although she didn't want to, um, Yasmin, perhaps you'd like to talk a little bit about that, um, okay. uh, about the historic nature of the change that's happened in this country. I mean, there's been a real shift. Um, I mean, Seth, when he was speaking about Asya Bibi's case, talked about a, a shift from the 1980s and the time of General Zia al -Haq. We've certainly had a shift from, since the 90s in the UK. And 
whereas perhaps my, my mother's generation would have been very aware of their rights if they'd been women of that generation, if they were seeking a divorce, would have gone through the English and Welsh court system or the Scottish court system, depending on which part of the country they were in. But now we're seeing Muslim women being told, being told that they must have an Islamic divorce, and without that Islamic divorce, they are not fully divorced, cannot remarry, and that if they remarry, they will be committing zina, which um, is an unforgivable sin and punishable by death. Um, the case that Gita is referring to is, um, is a woman who I called Lubna, um, same name as the woman in the film. Um, so she um, sought a divorce after many, many years of suffering domestic violence and um, had children and was told by a local imam that she needed to get um, a religious divorce. And under some pressure, even though her, her mother, who was supporting her um, and her family, they, um, they didn't think that this was the case, but under considerable pressure from the imam, um, trooped, duly trooped along to uh, Regent's Park Mosque, where um, a lot of things were said. There was a, a lot of pressure. She was told that she, the children wouldn't be hers that she must hand over custody, that she would have to pay um, at that time, and we're, we're talking about a period in the late 90s, um, £150 just to submit the form, and then each hearing would incur extra costs. This was in addition to the costs that were already, she was already facing in, in the English court system. But the thing that was most shocking was, was the nature of some of the questions that were being asked so in a room, I want you to imagine, as a woman who has suffered domestic violence, you're fighting for custody of your children. You go into this room with one person from your family, an imam who is supposedly a family friend. You're in a room with eight mullahs sitting in front of you. And they ask you, not only when was the last time that you had sex with your husband, but what was that sex? Did he ejaculate? Did he not? And the reason that you're being asked this question is to confirm... Um, sorry, I'm getting quite upset. Um, is to confirm the period of it, that, to make sure that, that you are not pregnant. Absolutely no consideration for the history of violence that the, and abuse that this woman would have been through. Luckily for this particular woman, her mother... Um, swore at the, at the mullahs, grabbed her daughter and said, we're leaving. And then fired off a whole load of letters to um, religious organisations, um, including Al-Hazar University in Egypt. Um, she, she wrote to um, a Jamir Sharif in India. She wrote to the um, university in Karachi and got letters back saying that they all agreed at this time in the late 90s that there was absolutely no need for an Islamic divorce, that the divorce that the English courts would grant was sufficient. And that process ended for that woman. But how many women are forced to go through this process? And I have asked women I have, who, who say, no, I went to the Sharia court, it was fine, it was okay. And I said, were you asked about the last time you had sex? And without exception, they all said yes. Because, and they justified it with, well, we need to confirm that I'm not pregnant. It just beggars belief. It absolutely beggars belief. The re-traumatisation, the, the ongoing abuse, the constant re-abuse of women in the name of religion. And there is no way to challenge this unless you're part of the One Law for All Coalition um, because you're, just, you're challenging the word of Allah himself. That's how you're seen. And how, how do you challenge when you have your extended family members saying, no, you must do this, the community members saying, you must do this? And that's where the pressure is coming from. The women that we've continued to gather evidence from as part of the One Law for All Coalition since we submitted the, um, the case studies to the Home Affairs Select Committee. When I say to the women, why do you need that, that um, certificate of colour? And their response to me is, is because my father wants it, because my mother wants it, because my uncle wants it, because the community leaders want it. So that really is our main finding, uh, where 
uh, there's a huge amount of literature, anthropological literature, uh, legal pluralist literature, and so on, which says this is women's choice, this is what they want. They go to the courts because they want to go there. Um, uh, but that is our finding, that these things are being pushed. And in fact, Muslim women in India, uh, because there are many different Muslim groups, the, the one that you saw is an extraordinarily brave group, but that works within uh, a context of um, living with and promoting uh, Muslim law, their rights under Sharia as they see it. Uh, but there are other groups that work with more secu secular um, uh, legal arguments, and they are making the same arguments that we're making here, saying that women are being pushed into arbit arbitration processes, they're being kept away from the courts, even if they want to go to the courts. They do have protections under domestic violence legislation and other things, and it's being made increasingly difficult for them. But I want to turn now to Afsana, because Afsana has fought and is in the middle of, in fact, a, a truly epic battle of the effect of what happens to somebody who lives in a country in which Sharia law is the law of the land. Um, so Afsana, would you just tell us something about that, please? I'm going to try to be brief. Thank you, Kita. Thank you, Mariam, um, and the One Law for All organization. Um, so um, I'm going to start off, actually, just to echo some of the things in the film. I'm going to come at this from a slightly different perspective about Sharia law because I've actually been divorced under Sharia law in another country. Um, and I want to say that when you think about some of the things that were coming out of the film and the protests, the mullahs, then they don't just exist in the Sharia councils and on the streets of Pakistan. They actually are here in the high court. Um, and I can actually um, sort of illustrate that through my case. Um, just very, very briefly, because I don't really want to go into the details of it, but um, I actually didn't have the luxury of a three-second divorce. I actually got divorced in absentee in a country uh, which is in the news at the moment, uh, Dubai. And I was divorced in absentee. I, I, uh, as I said, I won't go into the details. I had a, a child. I, um, I lodged a uh, claim uh, to the Dubai police about domestic abuse and my partner, my husband, kicked me and my 12-month baby out of the house and I was destitute for four years. I was homeless and destitute in Dubai with no help or support. And just like Matthew Hedges is finding, the Dubai uh, judicial system isn't exactly fair and uh, transparent. Um, that aside, um, what happened to me through the course of the four years, apart from being imprisoned and detained several times and beaten up in uh, a police station in uh, Dubai, um, I then found myself in a situation where I was divorced in a Sharia court. I wish I had Saif then, so he could have been my lawyer to defend me. But um, I was divorced in an Islamic court, and the reasons given for the divorce were I was a negligent mother, I had gay friends, that was against Islam. Um, I was being a clubber, yes, in my teens. I had clubbed extensively. Um, so I, I was basically an apostate. Uh, so a whole load of reasons uh, were given, including I couldn't breastfeed my child and I'd caused him eczema. So that, those were evidence of me not being fit to be a mother. And those were also the reasons given for the divorce and from that time that was pronounced, I wasn't there in court. Um, all my rights were basically erased and wiped away by this single sort of verdict. <clears throat> A lot of people, when I give them that story, initially assume, I, I'm of Muslim heritage, um, but obviously I don't look Muslim to them, or I'm not Muslim enough for the court, um, which is how they obviously saw me. Um, and it would have been acceptable, I think, to most people when they say the story, um, but you, it's an Islamic court, you must have been married to a Muslim. And actually, no, I was married to a white Catholic French citizen who went to and chose the Sharia court because he knew that that would guarantee him absolute 
rights. Because that just like Saudi, there is the whole male guardianship. I couldn't leave that country because they had taken my passport. And even if they hadn't taken my passport, I couldn't have left because I had just given birth and I didn't hold the documentation because of the male guardianship laws. I had no documentation relating to my child. So even if I wanted to leave with the best of the world to save myself from a, the hellhole of domestic abuse and Sharia law in Dubai, I couldn't have because who would leave their child after just giving birth? It, you know, to me, that would be just even more devastating. But the real battle, and I'm going to, because I know there are other speakers, um, I, I mean, it's, I've been fighting multi-jurisdictional legal battle in France and here for, I think it's eight years now, mm. it's spanning. And um, what I think is, I can share this now, is that that you would have thought was horrendous enough. Incidentally, my child was taken off me and I wasn't allowed to see him. He still lives in Dubai. And um, apart from that, I can't really say very much more and I don't want to dwell on the personal aspects. Um, what I can dwell on is the legal system. Um, I've actually been trying to battle here, um, not by myself. I have to name check Pragna and South of Black Sisters. And if I could get someone, people stand up and applaud them in the end, they've been absolutely, absolutely brilliant. I mean, they saved my life nearly. I was so depressed and traumatised, and if it hadn't been for SBS to come in and help me, I wouldn't have been able to take on a David and Goliath battle with the British judicial system. So my real frustration is actually with the Mullers of the High Court here, mm. because last year I had a... I, my legal challenge, if you like, was to overturn the Sharia ruling, much like Yasmin's work and, Ta and Gita's work, campaigning to recognise or not to recognise Sharia law and Sharia divorces. My campaign's very similar, is actually that the British court and the British legal system shouldn't endorse any, any judgement that goes against primarily human, fundamental human rights and women. I did not have a fair trial. Matthew Hedges was in the news and everybody was saying, oh, he only had a five-minute trial. I had a ten-minute trial where I wasn't allowed to speak. And after that, I was handcuffed and sent back to the cell for no reason at my own defence trial. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased in a way that that's in the news and it's shocking um, for Mr Hedges, who will probably get released um, because no guesses as to his ethnicity and his status with no disrespect to the family and their campaign. Um, but minority women and minority men in that country have no rights. So back to the UK court. So you have a judge who was presented with quite a lot of evidence. I had managed to uh, obtain my file from the Foreign Office, 2,000 pages of a subject access request with very contemporaneous notes about how I'd been treated and, for example, one incident where I'd been imprisoned with my son in a cell with 40 degree heat and no water or food for my baby. Um, and I'd written a complaint, and after a three-day quite harrowing hearing here in the High Court, the judge produced a verdict which said that I had, he accused me of demonising Sharia and making it sound like it was medieval. <laughs> quote, it's a quote. And it's the only time I think in the three days, I don't think Pragna was there, but um, another colleague from SBS, it was the only time in the three days, because you're told you can't be gobby and lippy to the judge because it looks bad on you. So I said, uh, it is medieval. So that, that didn't go down well <laughs> with him. And the, so he did not like me criticising, because I'd run a campaign, I'd actually managed successfully to change the Foreign Office website warning for women, British women who go to, so anyone thinking of going to Dubai, first of all, don't. <laughs> Secondly, if you do, and you happen to get yourself in an, an issue, uh, a family-related issue, is pick up your passport and your children's passport and get on the plane home. Um, so he, he felt, he actually went, I think, I think in legal terms, he did some sort of what they call legal gymnastics. He um, came up, he Googled 
Dubai personal status law and produced reams and reams of pages to justify how their law was the same as ours. And he actually did conclude that there's nothing wrong with Dubai personal. Sharia law isn't discriminatory. It's the same as ours. So obviously you can't really say anything to that. I mean, my barristers did try to point out that this was a regime that was quite known for human rights violations and Sharia law wasn't, you know, equal to women. And then there were other aspects, which I won't go into, but suffice to say that this High Court judge took it on himself to actually give a ringing endorsement of the Dubai judicial system, which we all know, because of a recent case, um, is, is not, is, it's not correct. Um, I also, part of that judgment, is he refused to acknowledge... Um, and it's actually, if anyone follows me on Twitter afterwards, you'll see it's on my pinned tweet. I had actually won a court, uh, uh, a case in France related to my case, in which the French court did realise, because they have a secular approach, that um, in law, the Dubai Sharia judgment does not afford women equal access and equality, equality between the spouses, which is which is what the case was constructed on. So I won that and secured that judgment, thinking, because we're all part of the European Union for now, that the British government, or British court rather, not the government, British court would recognise that. So again, this judge took it himself, totally dismissed it, said they didn't know what they were talking about, and it was all a lot of nonsense to him. Um, and uh, endorsed Dubai personal status Muslim law over that above a European court, um, uh, which is now, just to bring it, that's my sort of little story into Penny's worth, actually. So, um, so, yes, I'm still challenging that, but what I wanted to, I think the main point I wanted to draw, and I did submit um, as part of uh, South of Black Sisters' um, campaign, um, my, uh, um, my experiences to the Sharia inquiry. Uh, two things I would take away that came from that is, one is actually there is a quirk in uh, British family law that they do recognise religious divorces and talaqs, and in fact it was raised by the judge that if they do this, if they look at my case differently, what about all the other cases? So it, it would require... I'm in the midst of quite a few campaigns and still obviously fighting to have my son reunited with me. Um, but it is a good campaign, and what I would urge this, uh, this conference and the One Lawful Project is to look at that at some point, I mean, not necessarily now, because that's what's failing women. And the other issue is, which is really important, here it is in a country where we have fought and battled so hard for equality, the Equality Act, that you still have judges who believe that you know, Sharia laws and discriminatory laws and women who criticise them, campaigners like myself, are, we're, we're, uh, we're, it's, it's not medieval. You know, we're calling them medieval. So this outdated and notion, I don't want to say, I mean, it is misogyny. It's misogyny, it's patriarchy. You, you know, there's a whole list of things there. But I think people just think that it's something that exists and I want them to stop thinking that out there on the streets of Pakistan or India or in the Sharia courts. No, actually the misogyny is rife within the British judicial system. Actually, I think you slightly underplayed the importance of the judgment in France because my understanding is that actually French law applies to minorities the law of their country of origin. So it's not as secular as it sounds. And this is a fight that uh, secular women from minorities, from uh, Muslim backgrounds and others, have been fighting in France. And they've raised this many times. So actually your judgment is extremely important for that struggle, that actually secular French law should apply and um, uh, other discriminatory laws from other countries, that people are not permanently yeah. uh, foreigners, in a sense, in their own land, uh, being applied the laws of Algeria or Tunisia or Morocco, or in this case, uh, the UAE. So it was a very, very important win on a very long struggle, Sana. Thank you. Juzan, I want to... <coughs>
move us to talking about how people are actually challenging this idea that we you know, have to live if you come from a Muslim background um, or any other kind of background where you have to live within a set of religious laws. You know, can we talk about movements that are actually challenging that in other parts of the world? Yeah. <clears throat> First of all, thank you very much for uh, the introduction, Gita, and for sharing this, and, and Maryam and Wallo for all for inviting us to speak, and congratulations on the 10th anniversary of One Law for All. Um, as Culture Project, just to um, a little bit elaborate as well, we have um, organized a series of events where you were involved, South South Black Sisters, ICRO, and One Law for All, in UK Parliament, EU Parliament, with migrant European Migrant Women's Network, to speak about these issues and about different women's struggles and about how, although we live in a secular societies in Europe, in different parts of Europe, but how fundamentalisms, all uh, religious fundamentalisms are making a comeback and how they are influencing and affecting negatively uh, women's rights and, um, you know, and freedoms. Um, in Iraqi Kurdistan, that's where I am from, and uh, we have campaigned against Sharia law. Um, from 2003 onwards, where there was this writing up on the, of the new constitution in Iraq and Kurdistan, we campaigned fiercely against introduction of Sharia law. This was um, a constitution that was written under the occupation, US-UK occupation, and that they were um, making this whole um, uh, campaign, media campaign that Iraqi people want Sharia law and because they are Muslims and that that's the kind of law they want. And there was a lot of us, uh, women's rights organizations, men, writers, campaigners, uh, who really campaign against Sharia law. I mean, this is one of the problems that we suffer from now. Although from the outside, when you look at it, uh, there is this whole parallel living of some sort of uh, secular modernity, but also this Islamic um, appealing and, and Sharia law and, and uh, almost Islam has become a culture, a way of living, a way of thinking, and that is the problem really. In Iraqi Kurdistan, we don't have an Islamic state in place as such, but the problem is, and there are a lot of legislations that has been fought for by women um, in the region, but there are uh, still uh, these kind of things happening uh, uh, from polygamy to um, marriages of minors. I mean, it's not a marriage really, in my opinion, it's just a clear rape of a child. And um, triple talaq and a lot of other things really um, th that is happening. But there's also a fierce um, movement or for secularization and for secularism. One thing that might be a bit different you know, in Iraq and Kurdistan is that uh, most women organizations are secular. They are not arguing for women's rights within a Muslim or Islamic discourse that, for example, the rest of Iraq do. I have been in meetings where there were a lot of Iraqi women organizations. Maybe one or two of them would argue for women's rights within secularism. But the, the big majority, really, they argue for women's rights within Islamic framework because to them, Islam is an identity. It's identical to being Arab. And that is really uh, causing a lot of problems because when you go and when you campaign, you have these two discourses, one that think that Islam is identical to their being, the other is really arguing for women's rights within a secular discourse. I mean, for me personally, secularism is not the end of the road. It's not full happiness and full equality. And we live in secular states in the West. You have women's rights being violated, you have killing, you have rape, you have sexual harassment everywhere. You know, just yesterday I was reading in the news in a country like Germany, 147 women were killed just last year by former boyfriends or husbands and so on. In this country, again, one in three girls get raped or harassed or killed. Like, uh, you know, the, you have all these dramatic, uh, you know, uh, problems and violence against women because we live in capitalism, because there's class division, because there's poverty, because there is feminization of poverty. So of course you have communities who live within this context, they go back to the most misogynistic, to the kind of you know religions that they think they can get 
you know, uh, they identify with, they can, you know, it's a salvation basically. But of course, at the end of it, it's all violation against women's rights and against children's rights and so on. And it creates so much problems that you also spoken about earlier on that I would not go into detail about it. So the way forward really is to wage a struggle um, you know, for you know, women's rights and freedoms, even within secular societies, that there are still places and spaces for religion to play a role, especially when it comes to women's rights. Because basically, even though uh, you know, um, capitalist secularism is again backed by patriarchy and most institutions and state apparatus, you know, almost patriarchy is. In their, in their DNA. So that is the problem. That's why we have Sharia law problem in this country and lots of other problems and elsewhere. But, you know, um, in the Kurdish case, I mean, Kurdish women's rights, um, there's also another struggle in Rojava. I'm sure you've all heard about it. Um, you know, women took up arms against ISIS. ISIS is another big problem because the more you have the rise of Islamism in the Middle East, the more Islamists in these countries actually get empowered and they push for more and they fight for more, uh, you know, to convince governments here to actually allow them to be more uh, oppressive for the women in communities. So Kurdish women took up arms in Syria and fought for their rights, but also for gender equality and gender justice. And this is why when they, uh, you know, come up, came out with the constitution for Rojava, you know, no official religion was recognized. Uh, so it was a secular constitution fully, and then women's rights were fully enshrined, the age of marriage, that like you don't even need a, a parent's consent to go, you know, to, to marry someone, you just go to a civil office, you register your being together as partners and so on, and domestic violence and honor killing and all of that is completely banned in, in this new constitution, and there are a lot of institutions and women's rights and feminism and in, even in universities and high schools and so on, they do teach women's rights and um, all of these things. Of course, this is a, an example and an experience that is still surrounded by war and ISIS and Turkey, which is another ISIS in my opinion. You know, it's a big threat. So, uh, you know, so you have all this, it's an, in danger, but it has been really the beacon of hope, in my opinion, in the region at least. Um, at the moment. So, yeah, you know, you have this struggle. You have people who do not want to be identified as any religion or as Muslims, but of course, it is human rights to choose whatever religions they want to follow as long as it is not, you know, part of the laws to oppress women or to oppress children or basically, you know, um, to turn men, I mean, these gender roles to turn men into this abuser of women and children. What kind of gender roles and relations are we talking about? So this is really something disgraceful and we have to raise awareness about it and to fight against it at all levels and to also involve men to be aware about you know, the kind of role that religion is expecting them to perform in society, to be that kind of masculine, violent, abusive, dominant in the, in the family relation. And this is something that we have to also work on it um, and then to invite them to rethink about this kind of stereotypical gender roles that is only damaging to their own lives and the lives of women and children. And this is something we generally work around as a platform of feminist intellectuals, writers, and artists from Kurdistan but who are scattered around the world. And we do touch on these issues um, in the art forms, in writings, and also we have a magazine in Kurdistan whereby entire sections about it is all about feminism and gender. And of course, it's all argued from a secular discourse. So this is what we are trying to do um, on society level, but also in a wider society. Thank you. I actually wanted the panel to reflect a little bit about um, some of the things that Afsana said and that uh, everybody has picked up on, is that the issue of the power of the Sharia courts in this country is not simply because um, they've grown in spite of uh, the British government. Uh, as uh, Mariam's extensive research found, they have, several of them have charitable status, 
Those that don't have charitable status as independent organizations are run by mosques, which themselves have charitable status. They're under multiple forms of regulation, and yet the state has failed to do anything about them. Although there are occasionally arguments to regulate, which we have opposed because we feel that the record actually shows that there is regulation and that that regulation doesn't work and that all it will do is will entrench forms of Sharia in this country. So we have, for instance, the All India Personal Law Board, which was mentioned, which has been one of the main opposition to any advances in Muslim women's rights in India. Uh, their judgments, which are much more backward than the judgments of the Pakistani courts, the family courts, uh, and many, many other Muslim countries, it's that backward law Indian unreformed Muslim law that is being used in the Sharia courts in this country. So there is a, 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 a strong um, push uh, for the most toxic forms of Muslim law to be adopted over here, you know, wherever it has um, uh, uh, a, a basis in support. And I know that other panels will discuss it later, so I don't want to anticipate how this feeds into gender segregation, because it does, into issues of schooling. But the, broadly, the government has, a, has promoted faith schools. And I don't know if you see, um, any of you, the effect of having more and more religious schools <coughs> as, uh, as one of the issues that makes it harder for us to fight um, the dispensation of Sharia law. I'm, I'm really worried about the, 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 the kind of ceaseless expansion of faith schools and, um, and what it's reinforcing. The Islam that's being taught in um, Muslim schools in this country is not the Islam I was raised with. Um, it's not the Islam I believe in. I'm not being an apologist. I'm not going to do the, you know, this text says this and that text says that. I, d I don't ever do any of that work because um, I don't work from a an Islamic feminist perspective. Th those organizations are the recruiting sergeants for the Islamist movement. The indoctrination of our children that um, somehow Muslims sit in a hierarchy above anybody else of any other faith, that only Muslims have access to heaven, that boys need to behave in this way, that girls need to behave in that way. Um, the dress, the dress that these children wear, um, uh, mm. it is not. It, it's not. It's. It's also a denial of our cultural rights, as as Hosan has said. You know, the, there are 1.6 billion Muslims in the world, 1.8, with diverse histories, mm. diverse cultures, diverse languages, mm. um, music, art. All of those things are being obliterated. Because the only, the only Islam that is recognized within these organizations, but with, now also by the state, is the Islamist interpretation of it. And on the one hand, the government says we're fighting radicalization, and on the other, they're funding the very groups mm. that have radicalized those young men and women who have ended up in Syria, who have ended up in Iraq, who have ended up in Afghanistan. It, it, I mean, it's such a, I can't even think of the word. It's, it's anomaly doesn't sound right. Gita will help me out. It's the menopause. Um, I, I, it's just such a mess. It's such a bloody mess. And I wonder what it holds for the future. And when I look at those young girls, and I'm, when I'm talking about young girls, I'm not talking about teenagers. I'm talking about two and three and four year old girls mm. who were wearing jilbabs, who were wearing hijabs, of young boys of the same ages who are wearing these long jilbabs with their white prayer caps, who were being told every day that they have this sense of entitlement, that they sit at the top of the hierarchy of everything and that no one can touch them. And these girls who will grow up grow up believing that they are less than, who will never have any control over what they wear, what they eat, what they drink, their access to public spaces, their access to literature, to music, to theatre, to cinema, 
to all those things that we in this room take for granted. And we have a government that is deaf, blind, dumb, and frankly, mm. stupid. Mm. <laughs> Diana, could yeah. you t tell, us, tell us also, because you run a major service for women, of course. and these specialist services have been under threat from the very government that says, that they are pro-women's rights. Mm. So can you tell us what that's been like to try and yeah. keep that service secular and continue giving the services you give? Uh, exactly. Uh, you know, uh, organizations like us, uh, like Sassel Black Sisters, are actually not that many like them in the UK or maybe around the world because especially we are fighting for the very human rights and rights of children and rights of women and protection of them and against the, I don't know, against the apartheid, gender apartheid and many things that uh, in the world uh, actually allowed to happen uh, in country with the help of Western countries like as was say in Iraq, in Iran. Uh, the movement for uh, uh, radicalism or movement has been uh, yeah, very strong over the past few years with the help, again, of the Western countries. But in the meantime, the movement for secularism has been uh, grown quite uh, a lot, again, over the past few years. Now you can see in countries like Iran coming to the street and throwing their uh, uh, hijabs and... Uh, this is a movement everywhere, and in the UK, the movement against the uh, um, fundamentalist is very high, but uh, as you say, I've always I have been worried about the government policy because they allow these things happen, and it is, uh, they allow the issue of the cultural uh, relativism uh, in the UK to be tolerated as such as even seeing the children in the street, as you say, in the pushchair, you can see a little face just coming out from, a, you know, covered by hijab. And the things that annoying me very much, they say it's their choice. I don't know how children can be, uh, children age two months or three months or one year or ten years even can choose to be, to wear hijab, to, uh, to be, um, uh, fasting during their Ramadan because they are from Muslim family. So these things has been tolerated. And because of that, the government policy financially helped many of those organizations. And um, helping them and tolerating this kind of practices in the UK, which is against the law in the, of the country, which is a child abuse, for example, which is uh, discriminating women from their rights and entitlement in the UK. And in the other side, funds for organizations who are fighting the very fundamentalist issue has uh, been very limited or even sometimes there is none even. Our services, for example, one of our funds has been ended and it's not been replaced. And it's for women, uh, for Farsi speaking and Afghan speaking women, for example who on a daily basis they come to us, and we haven't got stuff even to respond to the high needs of those communities. And it, we have to, you know, our staff are everywhere just to try <coughs> to re really respond to the problem. And it's uh, extra work that we are demanding from our staff for, you know, because they can not just let women go. So uh, this is a problem in the UK that the funding really for organizations who are defending women's rights, children's rights, and they are uh, progressive women organizations and different organizations are progressive. The funding for them needs to be more available and <clears throat> allow them really to operate their, their works to the full capacity. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to give some examples of uh, the support that the government has given to these uh, fundamentalist groups. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion in the press, in our own writings, of the alliance of labor uh, and progressive organizations, generally so-called progressive organizations, anti-war organizations, and so on, with 
the Muslim right. Mm -hmm. And we've all spoken about it. Mariam has spoken extensively about it. Um, and the right-wing press have also commented on it. But the fact is that the Tories have been in power either in coalition or in a government of their own for about eight years now. Mm -hmm. And they have continued all these policies. So under their watch, uh, they, they were funding a group that was promoted as part of the PREVENT program of a, a safer giving program. So they were supposed to be the good charities to give during Ramzan rather than bad extremist charities. And who were these good charities? They were Muslim Brotherhood charities. <laughs> and they were jamaat -e islami charities. Mm. This is government funds telling people to give money to Muslim Brotherhood and jamaat -e islami charities. And as far as the Sharia campaign is concerned, the, 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 our campaign uh, for One Law for All, we found out that the government had quietly put on the divorce form that they are going to, um, uh, are, are going to uh, the, the government had put on the divorce form that they, that the civil divorce may not end all religious divorces and that they should refer to religious authorities for that. In other words, this British government that says it's going to take control of its own laws has actually forced the, um, the, uh, the uh, has conceded the point that you need two divorces in order to be properly divorced, a civil divorce and a separate religious divorce. That's where we are now. And on that note, I'm going to open questions to the audience. Um, so please raise your hands. Um, the, the reason I'm here, and thank you, thanks, Maria. Um, I'm so happy to see all like-minded people gathered in one room. Together, we can make it. We can really change it towards women's rights. This is uh, my actual idea. But what can we do? Uh, of course, we all do a great job. Of course, we're all doing, and we are all fighting, and we're all doing a great job. But the root of problem is to get rid of multiculturalism and cultural relativism. Because of these two roots, women are segregated. And in order to pass these channels, in order to gain their equality, not only they have to fight the imams, but also the, every member of the community they are living in, but also they have to fight their own government, which is called so-called secular government. And it's so hard for them to pass all these channels if they don't face the real consequences, which is honor killing and, and uh, exported to another country. Then they force with their own system of government, which is the, the, you have to have two divorces in order to be recognized as a divorcee or else you would not be able to choose your old partner. And if you do so, you face Zena, which is getting involved with other type of consequences, which is stoning to death. And it's happening right in here in England. It's happening in Canada. And it's happening in Sweden and elsewhere. Yeah. I'm sorry, only one way. We fought it, and we managed to get rid of faith-based arbitration in Canada. And now all divorce is happening under one secular law for all. Thank you. Anna. Maybe take a few questions. she got five minutes. Thank you all for such a rich uh, discussions and uh, uh, information. I would like to add. Uh, that uh, many years back, about you want to eight years ten... Oh, sorry. My name is Ahlam Akram. I am from Basira for Universal Women Rights, and it's the first voice of uh, of uh, a British uh, of Arab origin women standing for universality and secularity. And thank you, Mariam. You're doing a wonderful job. Thank you for showing us the way. Honestly.
What I would like to add is a few years back, I had a, an interview with, uh, with one, of, actually not one, he is the international leader of the Muslim Brothers who was an asylum seeker in the UK. And we had an interview together discussing uh, issues of women. And uh, I, I raised underage marriage because at that time, the minute the Muslim Brothers came to power in Egypt, they didn't want to set a, a specific age for young girls for marriage. They were against it completely. And his reply or his justification really shocked me. He said that you cannot compare the, the, the physical growth of a, a, a woman, a, a young girl in the Middle East in a hot climate uh, with the, the <laughs> physical, honestly, this is how ridiculous. And that he, he was given political asylum and he got British nationality while uh, Asia baby is, is not. You know, it's, it, it really, but what I would like to add as well, a bit of information that Muslim brothers, the minute they came to power in Egypt, they have sent mobile clinics to the rural areas in Egypt to, to, um, to, to do the FGM, you know, female genital mutilation, to do it under medical prescription or medical okay, thing, to to, and, and promote that, as well as uh, Wajdi name after the Tunisian revolution. And then we need to wind up soon. Sorry, yeah. Uh, he is one of the Muslim brothers' uh, thing. He went to, to Tunisia and he addressed over 15,000 Muslims in a mosque promoting FGM. So that shows you where are the Muslim brothers, where we are giving them power here in the UK. Thank you. I've, I'm sorry we don't have much time for more questions, but there's going to be a lot of interactions that we have. I just wanted to ask if anybody has any final statements yes. to wind up. I have. Uh, yeah. Afsana? Um, I just wanted to um, slight sort of different. Um, Yasmin was started off talking about constant acquiescing by a government. And obviously, we've been talking about Sharia. But I think um, one of the things to note is there's a very, very powerful religious lobby which includes also the Jewish community and the Hindu far right. I mean, I will defer to Gita on her expertise on that. So it's just not is Islam, as we, I think many of us are talking about. It's a wider. Um, and I think we have to recognize those forces and the influences they have at every sphere of our society, which, is, um, which, is, uh, which can explain why they're getting some of these uh, concessions. So I just wanted to sort of throw that in the pot as well. Um, I just really wanted to elaborate a little bit about the, my worries about the young generation, like the second generation who were born here from migrant uh, parents who came to this country. In my job, I work in schools and colleges and with 16 to 19 years old. Some of the most brightest uh, students we have are from the Muslim girls, the Muslim girls those who even wear the veil and so on. But that doesn't mean that they are fundamentalists. There is a wrong idea about young girls wearing a veil that they are all fundamentalists and they are all this and that. But actually, so many of them are some of the you know, brightest, but they have no uh, choice but to wear it, to be able to come to school and to be able to go to university. So there's also these kind of issues within the dilemma itself. And also, like, even in terms of their choices, you know, the gender roles that is taught in the community and at home, it affects their choices of choosing subjects, for example. Because you are a girl, you cannot do that particular, you know, you cannot go to that particular study, you cannot become a doctor, you cannot become an engineer or lawyer, and so on and so forth. So even they grew up with the idea that they cannot. But so many times, of course, I challenge these ideas, and we run a lot of talks and things with these young people to actually help them to challenge these ideas as well, to be able to speak to their parents. I mean, at some point, I asked them to bring their parents so that we can speak to them, even about going out to another city to study. You know, they have to limit their choices only to London because they have to stay at home. So what I'm worried about is really the, the lack of mobility as well, that young, bright, you know, generation of young people, especially girls, not the boys, basically, they can go anywhere. But the girls are particularly bound by these stereotypical gender roles 
that are taught from an early age, even though that they want to defy it, that they want to actually fight against it by studying and going to university, they are still very limited in what they can do and what they can achieve. And this is something that we really need to take into account and work on it uh, in future campaigns and so on, and that to get the young people's voices themselves heard as well about the, you know, the limitations placed upon them because of their gender, because of their background. One final point I would like to talk about is also the identity politics that young people, not only Muslims, but generally speaking, the wider society, British kids, everybody who are actually uh, there is a lack of vision, there is a lack of direction, there is a lot of, you know, suicide, self-harm, you know, depression and all these kind of thoughts among this new generation that we really have to look at it within this, uh, you know, problems that we are talking about as well because there is no particular ideas or ideologies or kind of struggles that they can get involved in that are meaningful because now everything is reduced to your identity, be it gender identity, sexual identity, religious identity, so on and so forth. Very individualistic, very sometimes selfish and self-centered rather than engaging in wider you know, struggles such as working class struggles, such as political struggles and so on and so forth. And of course the failure of the left, you know, I don't have to go and talk about it because they embrace Islamism and Islamic fundamentalism, but then you know they just have they don't care about you know an entire generation of young people who are just, you know, uh, there's no vision out there. So that's really the kind of, you know, some very few bullet points to say about, you know, you know, generally speaking, from my own personal experiences in this country, working from children or young people in school and colleges from all backgrounds. And, you know, of course, so when you have so much identity politics and no, you know, solidarity, no particular, you know, internationalism, the only solution now is ISIS. You know, ISIS has become the international unifying force for young people from the Far East to the Far West, and which is a shame, really. It's, it, that is the big, biggest criticism of the left itself that was once, you know, internationalist and mobilizing people across the world. But unfortunately now, that kind of leftist solidarity is broken down, in my opinion, and also feminist vision itself, my problems and your problems, and this is how we end up. Girls are not, they don't find themselves within the wider feminist discourse, even in this country. So really, there's a lot, a lot to talk about it, you know, uh, rather than a few more less, you know, if we address these issues, we can also fight the few more less in this country who are just the spokes spokesperson of uh, Muhajirun and Al-Qaeda and ISIS and, you know, the rest of the gangs, basically, Islamic gangs. Thank you very much for this. <laughs> Uh, I would like to talk about the um, child marriage in the UK that needs to be banned clearly and uh, to be investigated in everywhere that is happening in the UK. As I say, uh, it is really child abuse and the breach of human rights. And in my opinion, it's a crime that needs to be uh, stopped. And it's happened uh, under the Sharia law quite a lot. And imams are doing it everywhere in the streets of London and all the other cities. Uh, one issue that we would like to highlight is changing one of the law of the UK as well in terms of marriage, which is the age of 16 to 18. There is a gap that uh, it's, uh, a girl can get married at the age of 16 with the consent of the family, which allows lots of forced marriage to happen at that time. And we believe that the age of uh, uh, for a child should be a child should be considered from 18. Uh, 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 not before 18. So this law, we are campaigning to change it, and we were ha hoping that uh, to uh, make this ch change to happen. <coughs> the other issue, just very briefly, I would like to say, uh, fighting against the fundamentalists and in the other side, fighting against racism, both of them are the two sides of a queen, and I think uh, uh, we need uh, definitely always to mention that this, radical, uh, this uh, fundamentalist giving lots of opportunity to the racism to grow in the country and in Europe and other countries, which I think the racism 
uh, is a fair as well. Uh, we need always to have a very strong stand against racism and mention them always. Thank you. Um, I'd like to absolutely endorse everything else that the, the panel have said. Um, there's a couple of things. I'm going to plug my own research absolutely shamelessly right now. Um, so I've been uh, researching polygamy for um, about six years now, and I cannot get any politician in this country interested in this subject. Mm. That's in stark contrast to the work many of us in this room have been doing for years on forced marriage and on a base violence. And I think it goes to the heart of this issue and that it would require the government to stand up and actually challenge a religious group and say, mm -hmm. we will no longer allow you to circumvent the bigamy laws of this country. And the other thing is this whole concept of Muslim women choose. And I really kind of want to throw a grenade out and say, we're talking about a group of women. When we talk about minority women, not just Muslim women, but minority women in particular, what choices do they have? Seriously, what choices do we have? My generation fought not to have to wear shawar kameez to school. We fought so that we could go to university and our daughters could go to university because our parents were so worried about um, you know, us becoming so westernised. Women and girls are murdered because they choose mm. to wear makeup, or they, you know, the case of Hesha Yonis that, yeah. um, you know, that they, or, or Banaz Mahmood who had a boyfriend, or Shafilia Ahmed, all cases that I was involved in. And yet, Muslim women's groups constantly silence dissent from within Muslim communities by saying, Muslim women choose. We have no choice, because if you choose otherwise, the consequences for you, for your sisters, for your mother, for your aunties, for your cousins are dire, as are also the choices for our brothers. We've got to really take on this issue of choice and agency. It happens within a context. So that's one thing I'm going to say. The final thing I want to say is, is to try and end on a positive note, and I rarely do this, but I really want to <laughs> try, and try to do this. I want to pay tribute to Mariam. Um, it, Gita said in the introduction that um, I'm a Muslim, and I am, um, and I'm, it's, that's something I am proud of. It's part of who I am. It has helped to create who I am. Um, many Muslims would not recognize me as such, so we'll leave that one hanging there. Um, Mariam has built a coalition as has Pragna from South All Black Sisters, as has Gita from the Centre for Secular Spay, and all the women on this panel and many others in this room that give women like me a space to speak. This is where I have my choice to say things. I may be called an Islamophobe along with all the rest of you, mm. but that is a label I now wear with pride <laughs> because it means I have a voice and I can speak up. Our movement is growing. The battles are many, but we will win because there is no alternative.